Good afternoon. My name is Michel Toussaint. I'm a physiotherapist working in Brussels. I have um, an expertise in ventilation with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it's the reason why the organizers asked me to speak about non invasive ventilation in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Where are we now? So here we go. So there are three main respiratory concerns in those patients. The first concern is home mechanical ventilation. The second is the swallowing problems. And the third one is the emergency and airway clearance techniques. But before to join uh, those three main concerns, I will introduce a little bit the respiratory evolution in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And a very important item to measure is the maximal volume called the vital capacity. And when we look at the vital capacity in normal subjects, we see that uh, this value is increasing until 20, 25 years of age and then progressively decreasing um, with age. When we look now at Duchenne patients, we see almost the same curve, but all the curve is um, smaller and patients are reaching almost 50% of the normal vital capacity when they are young adolescents. And if they have the chance to survive until 30, 40, even 50 years of age, they can reach a zero of vital capacity. So it's important to determine adequate respiratory support by measuring the forced vital capacity. If we look at the vital capacity on this uh, figure, you can see that um, those patients have a decreasing uh, vital capacity, but also that uh, as long as they have 50% of more of uh, vital capacity, uh, normally they should still be able to uh, work and there will also be no or few risk for respiratory assistance. It means no ventilation, no need for cough assist techniques, also probably no problem um, of dysphagia. All the problems are starting when the vital capacity is less than 50% and at that time uh, when uh, the vital capacity is lower than 50%, there is a higher risk for uh, respiratory problems and also for respiratory compensation. If uh, we have to compensate for weak muscles and low vital capacity, we will compensate a little bit when the value is a little bit under 50%, but we will compensate, compensate more for larger decreasing. And finally, in patients with zero or close to zero of vital capacity, we will need techniques to compensate a lot uh, those patients uh, because they have no forced vital capacity. The restrictive syndrome of those patients can be defined as three problems. The first one is the reduction in maximal volumes, then the reduction in maximal respiratory muscle strength, and finally, the reduction in the thoracic and chest compliance. So we come back to the main uh, respiratory concerns. The first one, and we will start with that problem, is the home mechanical ventilation to be introduced in those patients. What can we say about that? The first thing to say is that there is a high level uh, of evidence with the uh, ventilation in, in those patients. Uh, those patients. It's very comfortable. It occurs with nasal mask during sleep and also it's a very effective treatment. Um, you have to know that it provides uh, ventilation. It provides survival over 30 or 35 years of age in uh, Duchenne boys. Uh, currently in Belgium, our oldest patient is 51 years and is still alive. He started his ventilation when he was 17 years of age and lost ambulation when he was 13. Uh, ventilation also requires the expert type of uh, specialized centers. 
and we can consider that a learning period is almost three nights at the hospital. Here we can see the difference between a patient ventilating uh, normally uh, on, on, on the, the left side and in, in red you can see a patient with the trend for high pen ventilation be because uh, this Duchenne patient is breathing quickly and also superficially. And uh, when you are breathing like that, you do not breathe deeply in, uh, with your lungs and there is a risk for hypoventilation. Uh, in Duchenne dystrophy, this uh, hypoventilation occurs normally between 15 and 20 years of age. Hypoventilation is defined by a PCO2 level in blood higher than 49 millimeters of mercury during sleep, and that was suggested recently by the, the group of Paris of Orlikowski and uh, colleagues in Garche. Um, when this um, item is met during sleep, then uh, we can consider, consider that it's an indication to start with nocturnal ventilation with a nasal mask in those patients. And uh, this ventilator will just support ventilation and um, go finally to a normal uh, level of PCO2. Uh, so hypo hypoventilation will be um, improved drastically with this treatment. What is the place for the tracheostomy? Finally, there is um, currently a, a very poor place for tracheostomy. The tracheostomy is never used as the, the first choice for nocturnal ventilation. Also, it's less and less used as the first choice for 24 seven days uh, patients. And the last indication for tracheostomy is when first there is no or no further access uh, to non-invasive ventilation, NIV is non-invasive ventilation, or when there is a need to uh, di direct uh, suctioning. When you need to, to have uh, suctioning, for instance, every five minutes, then yes, probably you still need uh, the placement of tracheostomy. This is a, a very nice illustration of one of our patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, this guy is 30 years of age and you, you see uh, this guy um, in the mountains uh, at 3000 meters of altitude. This guy is ventilated uh, 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week with non-invasive ventilation. And you see is on this slide on a sledge. You can imagine that his ventilator is on his feet. You see the tubing going in the direction of his head. And if you look um, very nicely on his face, you see his nasal mask because this guy is ventilated a night and day. So I like this slide because it just shows that when you are ventilated, even continuously, it's not uh, the end of your life. A second um, respiratory concern in those patients is the swallowing problems. Uh, there are three possible post-swallow disorders with uh, the food and with the drinks. A problem of residues, problem of penetration, or finally a problem of aspiration. This is a figure that we suggested uh, four years ago uh, to show the difference between residues, penetration, and aspiration. Residue just means that when you are uh, eating uh, solid, solid food, you can have residues that are staying um, just upper the vocal cords, and it can stay there for hours sometimes. The problem for residues is that when you go to sleep, for instance, and you are going in uh, the supine position, there is a risk that those residues will go into the lungs to make an aspiration. A second possible problem is what we call the penetration. Penetration is, is an incomplete aspiration. You clearly see that the bolus of food is taking the direction of the lungs, is going in the direction of the vocal cords, but at the end, at the end, finally, it goes in the right direction into the 
stomach. And the, the worst uh, problem is the problem of the real aspiration. Aspiration means that the bolus in total or par partially is going in the direction of uh, the lungs. And so it means that you have food in the lungs. We have four tools to assess swelling problems, dysphagia in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The first, the easiest way is just to question the patient and his family on the symptoms. What happens at home? You must know that. So the first question is, is there regular chest infections at home? Is uh, the patient coughing at, nine, at night? Is there uh, some loss of appetite? How is the length of the meals? Is it lasting longer and longer? And finally, are there so, uh, some shocking episodes in uh, the, the patient? If you have positive answers to those uh, questions, you can think that possibly there should be uh, a swallowing problem in the patient. A second tool is uh, the SSQ, the Sydney Swallow Questionnaire. The Sydney um, Question uh, questionnaire is in 17 questions. It is lasting almost 10 minutes when you are well trained to use that questionnaire. And uh, fortunately, this questionnaire is validated in Duchenne patients. Those um, authors in 2013, Archer and colleagues, suggested, suggested that there is a risk for dysphagia when the score is higher than 225. A third possibility of um, examination is the video fluoroscopy with a swallow contrast product. The, the, the good point of this examination is that we have objective data, um, but the problem is also that it's not easily available in every um, hospital. And finally, that specifically for Duchenne patients, it's, it's hard to have a, a good positioning of the patients in the sitting position with this uh, device for video fluoroscopy. Uh, finally, the first um, examination is the fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, called also the FIS. And the FIS is a direct observation with an endoscope uh, into the, the upper airways and the endoscope is placed uh, just a little bit higher than the vocal cords. So you see here on a Wednesday evening in our hospital, a consul consultation with a, a guy with Duchenne dystrophy, drinking liquids and eating semi-liquid um, food and you see that uh, this guy, during um, drinking and eating, is um, examined by the physician to see uh, what happens. Are there some um, are there some residues? Uh, is there possibly some penetration, or is there aspiration? And we saw uh, on one day, on one Wednesday afternoon, four patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophies. Uh, age, ages of those patients were 30, 24, 27, and 25 years of age. And we looked on the same afternoon uh, the presence of residues and penetration. And with the fees, we could see in those patients with liquids and uh, solids and semi-solid food, that there were residues, but also risk for penetration on the four Duchenne patients. So it's just to illustrate that um, we possibly underestimate the prevalence of residues and penetrations in uh, those Duchenne patients. This paper is a fantastic paper very, very nice paper from a team from the Netherlands. And the first author um, looked at the difference in uh, dysphagia 
between uh, CP, cerebral palsy patients, and NM neuromuscular patients. The most important uh, observation was that in the CP patients, the underlying swallowing problem was related to abnormal control of swallowing, meaning that there was a problem of coordination of the muscles, leading to, to the risk for aspiration of liquids. Cerebral palsy, the problem, the problem is liquids. Opposed to that, with neuromuscular patients, the underlying swallowing problem is muscle weakness, leading to the residue of solids, semi-solids, and pureed food in the upper airways, just higher than the vocal cords. In this paper, they have uh, shown that the prevalence of, for instance, the aspiration of liquids, it's much, it's much more important is in CP patients than in the neuromuscular patients. And opposed to that, there was um, more problems of, um, uh, of uh, aspiration and penetration uh, with the solids in the neuromuscular patients and much lower uh, aspiration and penetration of uh, solid food in the CP patients. It's the reason why in CP we will consolidate uh, the, the liquids to make that they are more uh, solid. For the neuromuscular patients, we have to take another strategy and to liquefy uh, the, the, the food. We have, for instance, uh, Duchenne patients uh, older than 40 years of age, still uh, drinking li liquids, but not able to eat for 10 or 15 years uh, already. An important point of discussion is the managing of saliva and oral secretions, leading to uh, bacterial colonization and chronic chest uh, infections. The advice that we can give is to start uh, in the childhood and to train children to sleep on their side and not on their back. Why? Because when pe people uh, with a neuromuscular disorder lie on their back, the risk for aspiration is much higher. You see this child with a, a type 1 S SMA, younger than one year of age, and this child is ventilated 24 hours, seven days, and you see some saliva expelled by the mouth. And that's the reason why this child is staying all the time uh, on her side to avoid aspiration of liquids. Here, her saliva. So we have seen a home mechanical ventilation. We have seen swallowing problems. And finally, we will now speak about emergency and airway clearance techniques. Um, in emergency, very importantly, you have to know that we have to avoid the use of long-term oxygen without the association of ventilation. So oxygen may be used, but always together with ventilation. A second point is to use uh, the cuff assistant techniques that we will see uh, later in this uh, presentation. And if the, the patient is not uh, too much fatigued, we also can use later in the disease progression, mucus mobilization uh, techniques. So what is cuff? Cuff is to promote and provide high expiratory flows like this. And so to, to have to obtain high expiratory flows, we need to um, make that patients will be able to cuff um, effectively so to cuff effectively, we have two possibilities. First possibility is to increase inspiration by air stacking. What is air stacking? Air stacking is using an external device to give some inspiration. And we will ask patient to not breathe out during two inspiration. And by this way, to stack two or three salvos of air into the lungs. When the patient has more and more air in his lung, it will be able to cuff at a higher inspiratory level than without air stacking by this ambu back, for instance.
Another possibility, this is the, the work of Del Amo Castrillo in 2019, they have shown that we also can train patients using non-invasive ventilation to stack air. And we see um, clearly on this slide that with breast stacking, uh, thanks to the ventilator, patients can improve their uh, cuff peak flow by almost uh, 100 liters a uh, minute. A second possibility is to uh, increase expiration by manual thrust on the chest. And by doing that, we will compress air into the lungs. And by compressing air into the lungs, we will also uh, have higher expiratory flow and therefore expel mucus uh, from the lungs. In the practice, very often we use one and two successively. So first, we will promote uh, the air stacking to increase inspiration. And after increased inspiration, we will also increase expiration by a manual thrust on uh, the chest. There is a device. The device uh, is called the cuff assist who is able to mechanically assist both inspiration and expiration um, mechanically. The problem of this device is that it has a cost and yeah, not every center is able to uh, provide uh, devices to uh, patients. If someone is interested to read more about emergency uh, and about every clearance technique in uh, techniques in neuromuscular disorders. We have uh, organized uh, three years ago uh, a meeting with almost 20 world experts on that topic. And this paper is free access and gives a lot of information on uh, cuff assistant techniques. For instance, the main, um, the main information of this um, paper is that we have uh, made a kind of summary uh, to know what is the best technique uh, to use to augment cuff in neuromuscular patients. And so we have compared six different techniques to augment cuff. One is um, MIE. MIE is mechanical insufflation exifflation plus MAC, MAC. This is manual assisted cuff. So it means cuff assist plus thoracic thrust. And opposed to that, number six, column six, is GPB. This is glossopharyngeal breathing. And between one and six, you have different techniques to uh, increase cuff. We looked at the cost of those techniques. Also, we made three categories of patients from the top to the bottom. The first category was patients with no need for assisted cuff. The second category was patients where we will consider the need for assisted cuff. And finally, the last uh, group is when there is an absolute need for assisted cuff. I think that the originality of this work was to use, you see that on the left side, the FVC, the forced vital capacity. We spoke about this item initially in this presentation, to use this force vital capacity to know almost if the patient will be um, part of the first group, the second group, of, or the uh, third group. And only when you know more about the vital capacity, you will also know more about um, the technique to be uh, chosen uh, to augment cuff in an individual uh, Duchenne patient. When we have used um, cuff, assistant, cuff assistance uh, techniques, also we can use the peripheral clearance uh, techniques. This is only um, a question of sputum mobilization. So these are techniques helping to uh, move secretions from the periphery into 
uh, the, into the direction of the upper airways. The first technique is def deflation. The deflation is just with the strap or with your hand to reduce the volume of the lungs. And when you reduce the volume of the lungs, you will also reduce the caliber of the airways. And when reducing the caliber of the airways, you will increase the air speeds. And when you increase the air speed, you will favor uh, also the, 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 the mucus progression in the direction of the roots. This is just to show you that there have been some papers controlling the effectiveness of uh, the of uh, here the, the the strapping with uh, different straps, and what you can see that is that for instance in a group control uh, with 50% of the total lung capacity, patients had a mean 3.2 uh, expiratory flow, but with the strapping you can see that those patients went, sorry, went to um, uh, 5.9 uh, liters uh, a minute. Sorry, I was a little bit too quick. A second, um, a second uh, technique is intrapulmonary percussive ventilation. And when we compare uh, percussion on the left side with pressure support, with, with BiPAP or non-invasive ventilation, with the photo here under of a Duchenne patient using a nasal mask at night. Percussion is a technique with uh, high frequency ventilation, also with peaks of, or, uh, peaks, uh, of pressure. And these peaks are, uh, of pressure are given with high frequency and also with little volumes of air. So interestingly, those devices do not uh, require the active participation of patients. So it is totally passive. It's a kind of ventilation with high frequency. The idea of this device is that the expiratory flows are higher than the inspiratory flows. And this has been shown by a work uh, of Freitag uh, in the Journal of Applied Physiology uh, almost 30 years ago, and they could show that with uh, high frequency ventilation, the expiratory flows are indeed higher than the inspiratory flow, making uh, a, a, a flow bias, providing a mucus progression from the periphery into the upper airways. So I will conclude now. Uh, on respiratory care in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, regarding ventilation, it's important to start uh, non-invasive ventilation, NIV, when nocturnal PCO2 is higher than 49 millimeters of mercury. Nocturnal ventilation is offered via a nasal mask. Tracheostomy is only needed when there is a need for constant suctioning. Uh, regarding the problem of uh, swallowing, we prefer in Duchenne to uh, give liquid than solid food in the oldest Duchenne patients. During emergency, please do not use oxygen without uh, non-invasive ventilation. And when patients are, uh, have uh, secretions, uh, use effective cuff augmentation techniques that we just um, uh, we just saw in the previous uh, slides. I thank you for your attention and I wish you success for the rest of the meeting.